when uh, when I was about I don't know four years old. It's a very early memory of mine. I was downstairs in our basement where we had a ping pong table, and uh, we were playing. And my older brother uh, told me, "Don't climb on top of the ping pong table." <laughs> so you can imagine what I did. I climbed on top of the ping pong table. And now that we were four years old, or at least this ping pong table was, you know, big. And, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of nuance in my speech. Uh, it was just a lot bigger than I was, and big is just big. So when, to my horror, the metal leg of the ping pong table buckled under my weight, and I slid off the ping pong table, I, I thought two things. Number one, I'm dead. And number two, the Angstrom household's going down. I mean, I didn't know how we would come up with the resources to replace something so big. And uh, I, uh, I, I felt this deep horror and, and existential fear. And, um, and I started crying uncon unconsolably. My brother could not quiet me, for sure. And I knew what was coming. My dad came down the stairs. And I don't really have a whole lot of recollection of what happened after that. But what I do remember, my dad remembers, is that I did not get punished. Uh, my dad knew that I was suffering enough uh, with the weight of bringing down the Angstrom household and all of its chattels and goods. And uh, I think what he realized was that what was most important was the restoration of the relationship. That's what it's always about. It's always about the restoration of the relationship. Now, today, um, our subject is overcoming spiritual obstacles. Now, spiritual obstacles sounds very abstract. We'll get into that. But an obstacle, a spiritual obstacle, is something that jeopardizes our relationship. That's what it's about. Something that jeopardizes our relationship. And the foundation, just to get to the key point, uh, the foundation of overcoming spiritual obstacles, which could be fear, shame, sin, <coughs> temptation, anger, failure, trauma. These are spiritual obstacles that sit like boulders in the highway of our heart. And the foundation for overcoming spiritual obstacles like these is having confidence in our relationship with God. There's just no other way to do it. That's the key point here. So if there is a big question mark in the center of your heart about your relationship with Jesus Christ, you will never be able to overcome spiritual obstacles. That's the, that's the way it is. You can try your whole life, but it'll never work if there's a question about your relationship with Jesus Christ, because He is the answer. Jesus says it this way, no one comes to the Father but through me. So that's the number one challenge to, uh, to address this morning. Now, we're going to look at Peter. I put David and Peter together because uh, King David, now, his major obstacle was a massive sin. Murder and adultery. Uh, it's bad. And actually, if you didn't know this, the psalm that we read is David's prayer of confession. So, if you want to do a little studying this week, it's just take the bulletin home and you can read David's sin and David's confession. And then... We could have switched the gospel in the letter reading. You'd have Peter's restoration and Peter's description of it. That's what we read this morning. Peter denies Jesus. That's also bad. When we think of Judas the betrayer, but we never say Peter the denier, all right, because there's a little bit of a better outcome for Peter. <laughs> Peter denies Jesus, and worse, he does it when he said that's the one thing he wouldn't do. Peter denies Jesus three times, and after claiming 
that he would lay down his life for Jesus. That's Peter. I'm going to lay down my life for you. And Peter and Jesus says, no, actually, you're going to betray me. You're going to deny me three times. And after that, the last look or the last frame of Jesus and Peter that we see in the gospel is this. Peter denies Jesus the third time. And if you know the story, the rooster crows. And that's like, oh. And this is what, how it's reported in the gospel of Luke. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. I've been at the spot in Jerusalem where that likely happened. We don't know for sure. But you can see it. And you can see as Jesus is walking out of this grilling before the, the council, you can see Peter standing there. And Jesus looks at Peter. And Peter sees Jesus' face. And Peter, it says, went out and wept bitterly. That's how the story ends for Peter. No more interaction with Jesus after that. There's no more connection. That's just it. Can you imagine carrying that burden in your heart? Do you think that's an obstacle? <laughs> a spiritual obstacle? A great magnitude. G Peter failed Jesus, and he failed himself. It's two sides of the same coin. And there is no coming back from that. So let's look at the beautiful way that Jesus, what is he going to do about that? How does Jesus handle this? Well, first of all, what I want to do as we read through the story, is I want to point out just a few things we're going to kind of like, what I want you to know along the way. The question is, how do we overcome spiritual obstacles? Okay, number one, we need to know what Jesus is doing in our lives. And this is what he's doing. He's gathering us together. Remember, the key point is the relationship. Okay, so what we see first that Jesus is doing in our lives and in your life is he's gathering. Just imagine Jesus doing this, like a shepherd gathering the sheep. He's doing this. The flock is scattered after the, the crucifixion and the resurrection even. Right? They, they, have, they have some engagement with Jesus, but it's not resolved. So they go back to what they do. They go fishing. They're scattering. And the flock is scattered, and Jesus gathers them. And, and what does he do? He calls them together. Now, if you have your um, Bibles, I'm in John chapter 21, and you'll see that the first thing they do is they have breakfast together. You could put all this in the reading. But they're on the Sea of Galilee. They go back to fishing because that's what they know. They don't really have a whole lot of sense of direction at this point. They don't know where all this is going. So they go back to their home. They go back to what they know. They're out in the sea uh, along the shoreline. And they're casting their nets and they're fishing. And Jesus appears on the shore. There are a lot of hills that kind of lead down into the lake, and so Jesus is probably standing up a little bit above them, and he's watching them, and he engages with them, and he said, hey, how are you guys doing? And they're like, well, not so good. He says, well, why don't you try on the other side of the boat? And you could, I think the wheels start to turn a little bit. That sounds a little familiar. And, and all of a sudden, they catch 153 fish, and the net doesn't break. And John... The beloved disciple is the guy that sees it first. He says, it, as he often does, he says, it's the Lord. And Peter does what Peter does. He jumps in the water. Now, it doesn't even say, and this is kind of funny, I mean, it doesn't even say that he swam to shore. You know, I, it's presumed. <laughs> but he had to do something. I wonder if he was trying to swim in the opposite direction. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> it's the Lord. I, okay, I'm out of here. You know, no, I think he did the other. But he was excited, but he does what Peter does. He runs. He jumps. And you can see that, that, but what it says here, and this is very moving, um, uh, just a second, um, the disciples, Jesus, they, they come to shore where Jesus is, and he's already prepared a breakfast there. And they knew it was the Lord. Um, uh, oh, wait, let me just start again. This, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. You see the reticence, the tentativeness, they don't, they know who it is, but they don't say anything. They're just stuck. They are so stuck. 
And Jesus is there, and he's gathering together, and he's calling them to breakfast. He's calming them down. He's showing them what his feeling is for them. He's saying familiar things. He's doing familiar things. And he's doing what we learned last week, which is take them out for food, have meals together. And so they have breakfast. And this is how it works. The movement of God is always coming together towards us, always gathering, always feeding. The way we see Jesus here is who he is. That's his most authentic self. Let's come together. Let me feed you. Let me serve you. Let me decide how it is that we're supposed to reconnect because you're stuck. It's the movement of God on our Sunday. This is a worship service. It's the movement of our liturgy where God gathers his people together through Jesus Christ, where he speaks the words of the gospel to them and invites them to the meal of fellowship. It's the movement of God. It's the basis for overcoming spiritual obstacles. And this is what we have to know. This was the first point. We need to know that this is what God does. This is what he does. He does not scatter. He does not push away. He does not, he, he does not um, push you out. He's actually bringing you in and gathering you together and calming you down and reassuring you of the relationship. This movement of Jesus to gather you is not trapping you. It's not a trap. It's an embrace. Sometimes we get confused by that. So this is an expectation that you need to bring into your time of prayer, into your heart, into your mind, when you think about God. The expectation is that He's bringing you to Himself. That's the expectation that you need to bring to your life of prayer. We pray like this, Father in Heaven, where I am scattered, where I am distressed, where I am turning away, meet me there and show me how you're coming to me, how you're gathering me, how you're feeding me. That's what you can pray. Okay. The second thing we need to know. We need to know that we simply cannot overcome obstacles on our own. Ever. Ever. We always need Jesus. Any work that you do to undertake improvement of yourself that does not include dependence on Jesus will lead you down the wrong path. Peter does not know what to do. None of the disciples know what to do. Peter does not repair the relationship. He's just overwhelmed. The reason there is a body of Christ today is not because a lot of thoughtful people got up to, uh, together and, and figured this out and decided what to do. This is Jesus from start to finish. Or to use the Bible words, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the first letter and the last. Always. We can never do this without God's help. Jesus knows that Peter is not able to recover without his help. Peter has no recourse. He has failed to the utter core. He's denied Christ. He's failed himself especially since he declared with such conviction that he would never do such a thing, but he did, and there's nowhere to turn. It's a dilemma. And that's always the nature of a spiritual obstacle. Spiritual obstacles are not like obstacle courses where you can train, you know, and, and have the joy of overcoming, you know, like a ropes course. That's not a spiritual obstacle. A spiritual obstacle by nature is one that we cannot get over ourselves. It's just better to realize that first. C.S. Lewis said that. You know, when you're working out a math problem, you, think you realize you made a mistake, don't keep trying to solve it based on the mistake. Better just to admit, hey, better start again. Now, why did he have to even say that? Because we don't do that. It's simple as it sounds. It's a delicate situation, though, isn't it? Here's Jesus, now the risen Messiah, Lord and King. I mean, he's God. And here's Peter, a massive failure. So what I want to just show us again, and this is the second point, we cannot overcome spiritual obstacles on our own, by definition. If you could, it wouldn't be a spiritual obstacle. It would be, I don't know what it would be. All right, so when we're dealing with shame and fear and sin and failure and trauma and all those other things, which are all related, okay, we just need to start with that fact. 
Have we embraced our need for Jesus? All right, are we doing it on our own? Or have we embraced our need for Jesus? Are we embarrassed by it? Are we irritated by it? Lent is just such a great opportunity to just kind of come to terms with the fact that we are needy. All right? And we need to embrace that. That's the second point. Okay, thirdly, overcoming spiritual obstacles means that we have to get to the particular details. This is the hard part. All right, if I ended the sermon now, we'd be fine. We'd just go off these abstract notions of fear and sin and failure and all these kinds of things, which we don't really understand what they are. That's not the way it works. All right, if we're going to face spiritual obstacles, we have to face the particular details in our lives. And they're different, but they're particular. It's not abstract principles that are going to help you. It's not a method that you're supposed to follow. It's not about you getting compliant all right, with a bunch of rules. Okay, Jesus shows up to make breakfast. He does not show up with a clipboard. Okay, and if your image of God is with a clipboard, it's the wrong image. The clipboard God is, well, okay, here, let's see. Uh, we're just going to go through the list of all the things that you can do better. All right, because, because we don't want to go through that embarrassing thing again. All right, he doesn't do that. Because that wouldn't help. I mean, Peter did all that. And it didn't work. And friends, you know, some people really never get past this point. They really do think God has a footwork. And, they, and that's just it. And if I try harder and do better, I'm going to make it past the pearly gates. That's not the gospel. It's not about becoming better performers. It's about becoming mature. And maturity happens when God addresses the particular details in your life that you are, on your own, very afraid of and can't do anything about. This is Peter's example. that Peter was embarrassed. That's probably not strong enough. He was ashamed. He had a deep shame, a spiritual obstacle shame. And he was hanging out there by himself. He was hurt and grieved and in distress not because of general abstract things that he wasn't doing well in his life of faith, but because of a specific thing that he did and didn't do. He didn't lay down his life for Jesus. He did deny him. That's why he's suffering. And Jesus knew that if he left Peter dangling there with a big question mark, as I had said before, over himself, do you realize what was at stake? This is Peter, the rock. Peter could never, ever have become the apostle Peter with a question mark over himself. And he would have been a horrible leader if the resolution was his own personal success. Who needs that? Peter wanted to follow Jesus. He wanted to. Peter wanted to prove himself. Peter wanted to experience the joy and exhilaration of being part of the Jesus team, and he failed. Spiritual obstacles are always deeply personal and specific, and we have to be willing to let the, spirit, the specific details of our obstacles come to the surface with God's help. Why are you angry? Why are you sad? Why are you tempted? Why are you ashamed? Why are you afraid? Why are you proud? What have you done? What was done to you? There are no right answers to these things. They're only the things that are in your life. They're rooted in your life. And if God is going to help you, it's not going to be by the result of just simply trying to live a better life, but by actually discerning how God wants to address your particular stuff. That's why it's pointless to just to kind of compare your spiritual journey with somebody else's. What matters is that you are listening to God. That's what matters. Are you listening? It's hard, by the way. I don't know why I'm so upset. I, I mean, these are complicated things. Okay, so that gets to the fourth and final point. Okay, this is the final point. Just remember, number one is realizing that God is gathering us to himself. 
That's the first point. Second point is that we cannot overcome obstacles on our own. All right. Remember the third point is that we have to get to the specific and particular details. And here's the final point. Overcoming spiritual obstacles takes time. It's a process. And it will take us out of our comfort zone. Okay, that's kind of boring. The process that takes time is a certain kind of process. It's kind of comfy there, sorry. Here's the point. Jesus will not stop at the surface. Oh, we want him to, don't we? <laughs> Alright, that was enough, Jesus. Uh, you only had to really ask me that one time. Like, you didn't need to say it three times. Right? I mean, it would be so much easier if, oh, we just didn't believe the surface. And, oh, that was enough. I got a little wet. That's good. Jesus won't. He will not stop with that. He is going to dig deeper because the failure and shame is so deep. If Jesus had been a wimp and stopped at question number one, Peter would never have been helped. He would have been left with a question mark. Peter needed it. Otherwise, he would always have wondered. And we are not supposed to wonder. I, I know this could be complicated, and I'm not going to let it get complicated, but friends, we need to be assured of our salvation. We are supposed to know. We're supposed to. Paul says we are to know the love of Christ. All right, we're supposed to know that we're adopted into his family. And Peter needed to know. And he didn't need an explanation. He needed a healing here in the gut. Jesus had to strike to the well of emotion to get to Peter's heart and to get to the wound so that the grace could get there. And if he had stopped prematurely, it would have never happened. That's just part of the process. It's a process to get there so that Peter would know. And did it work? Yes. yes. How do we know? That's that marvelous prayer that Peter says, though you have not seen him. He's telling everybody else now. He's excited because he's Peter. He says, though you have not known him, you love him. Why? Wait, he's lovable. I've experienced it. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Do you see the result of that process? If Jesus had stopped at number one, he could never have said that. Peter could never have said that with just the first question. It took three. It took three. Why three? Because Peter denied Jesus three times. Peter denied Jesus three times. And if Jesus had just stopped with one, there would have been two left that Peter would have wondered about. Jesus takes him back to the very thing that he struggled with, and he brought grace and healing all the way down to the very core so that Peter could say with absolute conviction, I am filled with joy. I don't see him, but I love him, and so do you. It worked. The foundation of overcoming spiritual obstacles, the foundation is being confident in your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's a requirement. Love is the bedrock upon which everything else is based. And if you have a question about it, that is your spiritual obstacle. If you're not sure, that is the first spiritual obstacle that you need to address before any of the other ones are addressed. Or, in the process of addressing all the other ones, Jesus will address that one first. This is what I want to close with here, is this fundamental question. Are you confident that you belong to God? Getting baptized and saying the creed and coming to church does not qualify. That's a clipboard approach. Those are important things. I'm not saying they're not important. But because you do them, or because they've been done to you, does not mean that you qualify as knowing that you belong to God. 
Some people do religious stuff just to comply with the expectations, but that's not what pleases God. That's not what God calls saving faith. Peter talks about the salvation of your souls. We don't say that we have saving faith because we check boxes. Plenty of people complete all of the actions without ever knowing God at all, and God takes no pleasure in that, none. I'll tell you what he says. When we read this a couple weeks ago from the book of uh, John's Revelation to the church in Laodicea, because, this is Jesus speaking, because you are lukewarm, just compliant, check the boxes, I will spit you out of my mouth. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. That's saving faith. That's what Jesus cares about. And if this describes you, I mean, if you're not sure, if you've just been compliant, but you can't say whether you really know God that way, then this is the day that needs to be solved. You should know. If you've never repented of your sin, getting baptized is fruitless. If you don't actually know Christ personally, saying the creed is irrelevant. Those are good things. But the church has always taught, always. Augustine himself said, if you get baptized but have no faith, you receive the waters but you have not been saved. Those things matter when they're joined with real faith. And if you're asking yourselves, well, I don't know, this is too complicated, let me give you a little help about what it means to have a personal encounter with Jesus. If you've never repented, I'm not talking about compliantly, like I said, before, you know, I said something. If you've never repented of your sin, that's a warning flag. Repentance means that you actually feel sorry to God not just in general. When they ask the disciples, how then can we be saved? What do they say? Repent and believe the gospel. If you've never repented, that's a warning flag. Okay? If you've never felt anything about God, this is as basic as I can say it, that's a warning flag. Now, feelings can be all over the place. What I mean by feelings are, have you ever sat in a worship service and felt something? Even about the people around you, that's good. That's a good sign because, you know, when we're belonging to Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in our spirit. And here's how Paul says it. He's bearing witness that we're children. Now, if that sounds a little complicated, here's what that means. Something in you has to say, wow. That's what it means. Something in you says, I felt that. I think that was God. It can be that basic. If you've never repented of your sin, it means you've never felt. If you've never been in a situation where you're like, wow, God, I, I think that I felt you. That's a warning flag. If you've never been able to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, what does that mean? When we, the, the apostles said, to be saved, you have to confess in your mouth that Jesus is Lord. All right, what does Lord mean? It just means that you acknowledge Jesus personally as he's my master. He's the one that I follow. I will follow him. Have you thought that? Have you said that? Have you confessed it with your mouth? Do you know that the Bible says that there's only one way that anybody can ever say Jesus is, is Lord, and that's in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a gift. When you can say Jesus is my Lord, that is an important sign that the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. That's saving faith. I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about if you've never really repented of your sin, if you've never felt the witness of the Holy Spirit in you somehow, even at a very basic level, saying, I belong. If you've never confessed with your mouth and meant it that Jesus is my God, then you are not saved. And your soul is in 
deep jeopardy. You can't be uncertain about this. It's very important for you to know. This is not about perfection. It's not about doing it the right way. This is not about scare tactics. But when Jesus himself says, I will spit lukewarm people out of my mouth, we need to hear what he's saying. What he's saying is not that I'm an angry guy. What he's saying is I'm trying to get into your heart. I'm standing there knocking. I want you to open it. And I'm, I'm trying to describe what that means. Opening means I'm sorry, Lord, that I sinned. I'm like Peter. I'm like David. And I know that when I look at the cross of Jesus Christ, I know that you have forgiven given me, as unfathomable as it sounds, when I look at that cross, I see that you have covered my sin and you have welcomed me into your family. And I'm so grateful. I will follow you as my Lord and Savior. You can pray that right now and know it. And if you don't know it, then either pray it with me or come up to a prayer minister or see one of us afterwards so we can pray with you. That's a spiritual obstacle. Now, you may be the kind of person that's done those things authentically, but you're still really struggling to understand it or to know if there's still a big question mark there. That's a different kind of problem. That's a problem of just receiving a confirmation of God's grace. And we can do that all the time. Every Sunday worship service, we're getting reminded in our supper that, yes, it's true, the Lord really did forgive you. Uh, we need to hear that every single day. You know, the Bible says the Lord's mercies are new every morning. Friend, if you've not repented and accepted by faith the death of Jesus Christ to cover your sins, and if you've not confessed with your mouth that he's the risen Lord and your Savior and Master, then I invite you today to pray a prayer of invitation, of accepting Jesus' invitation, saying, yes, Lord, I repent of my sin. I want you to dwell within me and cleanse me. I want you to give me a new heart. I confess that you are Lord. You can do that right now. And if you're just confused, if you're not sure, that's okay too. Just come and talk to a spiritual brother or sister in Christ that's more mature than you are, a little farther along the way. And ask them to confirm that in you. As we go forward in our engage groups this week, we're going to be talking about spiritual obstacles. And I just wanted to kind of clear the way for that. That's the point of this sermon. To just clear the pathway so as the Lord begins to speak to you about these things. You can, number one, know that God is good, that he's gathering you to himself, that he's helping to get to the source of the problem, that his will is kind and merciful to you, and that you can have an exclamation point over your heart and not question it. Amen. Um, I'm going to slightly change our order here this morning in response to how Father Steve has um, really ministered the grace of the gospel this morning. I feel like I want to I want to take us to the confession first. I know the Lord has stirred up conviction in a number of our hearts. I feel like I want to give us a way to respond to that immediately. And then we'll go to our creed. Father Steve did not mention that as a matter of fact, there was in some ways a general ministry of the Lord's forgiveness and peace to all of the disciples, including Peter, in the upper room, when he breathed the Spirit on them and said, peace. Peter was probably standing a little bit back, not sure how much I completely applied to him, which is why Jesus does this beautiful thing. He goes very, very specifically into that. Right after that revelation, Thomas makes a huge confession. He makes a creedal I believe, statement about Jesus. So what I want to encourage all of us to do here this morning is to make our general confession and receive the grace of the Lord and then receive the communion at his table. Just as Peter received that breakfast. 
And then some of us, probably some of us, maybe more than a few, need to be very specific in making that confession of faith and repentance with the prayer minister on the side and Father Stephen being after the communion has been distributed. Because it does need to be very specific. But we'll begin together, as the disciples did in the upper room, by uh, confessing. So if you flip your page to the next page, let us humbly confess our sins now to Almighty God.